Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of issues and topics, all from a Catholic perspective. Wineskins is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our program today, I will interview Diana Hencherenko on young adult ministry. We will also hear more information on St. Bernadine of Siena. And today, as the Church celebrates the Ascension of the Lord, we will get a deeper insight into those particular Sunday readings. That and more on Wineskins. To tell us more about world communications is Brother Dominic Calabro. The theme for the 55th World Day of Social Communications, celebrated this month, is Come and See. It is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 46. It is a call to communicate and encounter people as and where they are. The words Come and See are central to John's Gospel. The words were chosen by Pope Francis to set the tone for this special day where God meets us where we are, and in turn, we are called and challenged to do the same. This is especially true for those of us involved in media and communications work in the church. Come and see were the first words that Jesus spoke to the disciples who were curious about him following his baptism in the Jordan River. He invited them to enter into a relationship with him. More than half a century later, when John, now an old man, wrote his gospel, he recalled several newsworthy details that reveal that he was personally present at the events he reports and demonstrate the impact that the experience had on his life. This is how Christian faith begins and how it is communicated. It is direct knowledge born of experience. Come and see is the simplest method to get to know a situation. It is the most honest test of every message because in order to know, we need to encounter, to let the person in front of me speak, to let his or her testimony reach me. In communication, some things can only be learned through first-hand experience. We do not communicate merely with words, but with our eyes, the tone of our voice, and our gestures. The disciples not only listened to his words, they watched him speak. The word took on a face. The invisible God let himself be seen, heard, and touched, as John himself tells us. The word is effective only if it is seen, only if it engages us in experience in dialogue. For this reason, the invitation to come and see was, and continues to be, essential. The good news of the gospel spread throughout the world as a result of person-to-person, heart-to-heart encounters with women and men who accepted the invitation to come and see and were struck by the surplus of humanity that shone through the gaze, the speech, and the gestures of those who bore witness to Jesus Christ. Every tool has its value, and the great communicators of the New Testament would have used every tool available at their disposal at that time. The gospel comes alive in our own day whenever we accept the compelling witness of people whose lives have been changed by their encounter with Jesus. For two millennia, a chain of such encounters has communicated the attractiveness of the Christian adventure. The challenge that awaits us, then, is to communicate by encountering people where they are and as they are. May God grant us the grace to recognize our dwelling place in this world and honestly tell others what we have seen. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. St. Bernardine of Siena was a priest. To tell us more is Brother Dominic. He is from the Society of St. Paul in Canfield. This great popular preacher and promoter of devotion to the holy name of Jesus died at Aquila, Italy in 1444 and was canonized six years later. Born near Siena, St. Bernardine lost his parents before he was seven years old. After completing his studies at the university there, he entered the Franciscan order at the age of 22. His first 12 years as a Franciscan were spent mostly in retirement and prayer but in 1417, he began a ministry as a preacher. From 1438 to 1443, he was commissioned to reform the Franciscan order, 
but he succeeded partially in reconciling conventuals with the spirituals. He also worked as a peacemaker between feuding cities, and in 1427, Pope Martin V asked him to accept the bishopric of Siena, but Bernadine refused. Then from 1430 until 1442, he returned to the task of reforming the Franciscans and with great success. He died at Aquila on the Vigil of the Ascension in 1444 while en route to the Kingdom of Naples. He was canonized six years after his death. The Latin version of the opening prayer of the Mass focuses on the particular traits of St. Bernardine as a reformer, preacher, and writer. In the English translation, however, the theme is St. Bernardine's special love for the holy name of Jesus. Then we ask that we may always be alive with the spirit of your love. To appreciate the importance of the devotion of the holy name of Jesus, it suffices to read the excerpt in the Office of Readings. Bernadine considered the name of Jesus to be a compendium of scripture and a symbol of unity. He invented the logo IHS, meaning Jesus, Savior of Mankind, and he had it painted on a board which he would hold aloft in the pulpit. Some persons accused him of superstitious practices because of this, but he was exonerated after an investigation by a team of theologians. Pope Nicholas V stated in a bull of canonization that Bernardine served and followed Christ. We do well remember St. Bernardine's statement made like a true Franciscan. If you speak of God, speak with love. If you speak of yourself, speak with love. Take care that there is nothing in you but love, love, love. The opening prayer states, Father, you gave St. Bernardine a special love for the holy name of Jesus. By the help of his prayers, may we always be alive with the spirit of your love. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. Diane, I know that you're involved on the national level as well. Tell us about that involvement and what is so important about, I think, us in the diocese participating on the national level, but also tying our local church with the national church. Sure. I have the privilege of serving as the chairperson for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, their national advisory team on young adult ministry. And it has been just a wonderful experience. I think one of the great things about having those national relationships is we get to learn what other dioceses sure. and other groups and apostolates are doing, but then we also get to share what's happening on our local level, and we do have some wonderful things going on. So it's a really nice relationship. The field of young adult ministry is still rather young. Mm -hmm. It is rather new to the church, and I think there's some people that are still trying to understand it and figure out how it fits in their parishes and how it fits in diocesan life as well. So the more that we can share, the more that we can network with each other, share some good ideas, build up some of those relationships to help the young church. I think that that's ideal for everybody involved. Let's talk about some of those success stories that we've had here in the diocese, but also on the national level. What are some of those stories that you have brought back or you can bring back to us to help us? Well, I have, I think I'm a little biased here, but I think one of our great success stories is the ministry that we have at St. Angela Marici mm -hmm. Parish. We've been working at it for about five years now, and we have built some wonderful relationships with young adults in mm -hmm. our community and, and actually even in the surrounding community. One of of the things that I think it's very important to remember for young people is that parish boundaries really don't mean a, a lot to them. Sure. And so they just want to be around other young people mm -hmm. that would have similar values and, and similar mindset to them in terms of exploring their spirituality. So there's a lot to offer there. And so if there's some great event happening at one parish or another, they'll attend it sure. as long as they're invited to be part of the community, which is absolutely wonderful. But even in our own parishioner base at, at St. Angela, we have built up relationships and been able to accomplish so many of our young people, which is really terrific. We have young people now serving on our pastoral council, that are serving on our finance council, mm -hmm. that are taking on leadership projects and different endeavors. Through our time of pandemic, as we needed to start a live stream, one of our young adults who's a filmmaker was able to step up and help as an offering of service. Yeah. So uh, really just having those relationships and starting to watch the seeds that were planted bloom, it's absolutely wonderful. We also have started to see just a lot more young adults that have come to 
mass and that are starting to participate in the fabric of the community. So that's ultimately what we want. We want to see them uh, have space and, and be welcomed in and to begin to develop their own spirituality and their own relationship with the church. As far as some of the other national initiatives that we've been able to have some relationship with, I think it's just hearing some of the wonderful things that, that are happening. You know, we, we've mm -hmm. gotten ideas for retreats and we've gotten ideas mm -hmm. for small things to try, especially at the parish level, different conversations to have. We've also been able to participate virtually with racism and sensitivity training, mm -hmm. learning about different spiritual practices. Sisters of Bon Secours in Baltimore, Maryland hosted mm -hmm. us, which was absolutely wonderful. Right. So building those relationships, again, if parish boundaries aren't bad, then also the other boundaries don't matter either. So there's a lot there that we can work with, and it's really exciting and very promising for our young people. In order to keep something like that going and alive, what is your advice to some of our older seasoned Catholics? How can they get involved? How can they be mentors? How can they be open and accepting, especially of, of young adults? It really does all go back to the relationship part mm -hmm. and that spirit of curiosity. I think, and I hear from a lot of older parishioners that, that they feel like they have to have their lives all together before they can mentor. Sure. And certainly we know that we all have our, our strengths and our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That sense of authenticity, the sense of, of not having it all together, but being committed to the journey mm -hmm. means a lot to young people. Sure. If they know that you've had some wonderful joys in your life, but also some sorrows or some moments mm -hmm. that maybe you're not so proud of, that sense of authenticity just goes a really long way because then they don't feel that they have to be perfect. And so just cultivating that, building relationships, asking young adults about their story, what brings them to the church, what keeps them there, what are they interested in, just taking that sense of interest and taking that a sense of curiosity and just diving deep into that will go a very, very long way. And also, I think, too, not making assumptions and not talking down to them. Sure. I think that really makes a big difference as well. And just that I think we assume that we know somebody's story or that we would know why somebody would be there, but really we don't. We need to have those conversations. We need to get to know other people and especially our young people. And what are your plans on the national level to have this ministry grow and blossom within diocese? Right now we're working with the field of young adult ministers, which encompasses so much. So certainly it's diocesan directors, it's parish leaders. There's been a lot of movement within religious communities, especially our, our religious sisters, mm -hmm. to cultivate young adult ministry. So we're really trying to, to just work together to strengthen how can we open as many doors as possible to our young people. So we do try to come together to share best practices. The National Advisory Team does host a big event every year, and so that brings speakers and it brings other people in to share their ideas. We listen to that on the national level too so that we can figure out where we need to go and how we can navigate these times and how we can best navigate ministry and point people in the right direction. Unfortunately, there's not a silver bullet. There's not a template that's going to fit every parish or every diocese. But what we can do is equip people with enough knowledge and enough experience that they can tailor things to their individual communities so that they can begin to work with young people. I think some people just feel, and I've seen this in different parishes, different dioceses, that they're so afraid of making the wrong move that they're paralyzed. Sure. Try something, do mm -hmm. anything, just make that first step to invest in our young people. And it may not go perfectly, but I'm sure it will go well if we just make that investment and just try something. What would you tell the folks that are with us about your plans for the future and our plans together as church to maintain this spirit of invitation and relationships, especially where it comes to young adult ministry? My plans for the future, I don't know really. I follow the Holy Spirit and kind of the nudgings of the Holy Spirit. If I had to tell you five years ago that this is where the ministry of, of St. Angela Marie to young adults would be, I would have been way off. <laughs> and that's part of the joy of letting the Holy Spirit kind of lead. So I think just approaching ministry with a spirit of openness, continuing that down the road of, of building relationships, operating out of a sense of curiosity. As long as I can continue to dive into that, as long as our community can continue to dive into that, I think Think we'll be in wonderful shape and we'll continue to see young adults come in and take their rightful place at the table. Diana, thank you for your wonderful work in young adult ministry, not only here in the diocese, but on the national level. And thank you for lifting that up for us because it's so important and vital to who we are as church. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit www doy.org, the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. 
Mothers and fathers help shape the lives of children God has blessed them with. Catholic Charities feels Mother's Day to Father's Day is the perfect time to hold the annual First Step for Change campaign. First Step for Change helps provide assistance to low-income pregnant women and families with young children in obtaining infant supplies such as formula, diapers, and clothing, as well as case management and parenting support. Last year, Catholic Charities First Step programs assisted over 600 households. Please support the collection at your parish this year from Sunday, May 9th through Sunday, June 20th, or donate online at www.ccdoi.org or call the diocese for more information at 330-744-8451, extension 323. Hello, I'm Bishop Dave Bonner, the Bishop of Youngstown. Today, I come before you for my first Bishop's Appeal. These monies help to support the poorest of the poor. They help us with our religious education programs, schools, and parishes. I ask you to give according to your circumstances and to know that your gift is greatly appreciated by all the people in this local church. Thank you, and God bless you. To learn more about the Bishop's Appeal or to make a donation, visit doy.org. By the time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Church World Service. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Our song today is from the CD called Ave Maria. Joy and in our 
speel. As we celebrate this Feast of the Ascension of the Lord, we will hear more about the Sacred Scriptures by Father Matt Humrichhaus. He is a parochial vicar at Holy Family Church in Poland and the sacramental minister at St. Luke Church in Boardman. Today is the Feast of the Ascension of the Lord. We celebrate the day that Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection. In today's Gospel, we see Jesus commission his disciples to go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. He essentially instructs them to carry on his mission while he is gone. But he was not leaving forever, nor did he leave us without a guide. He didn't just float away and say, good luck with everything. Next week is Pentecost, and I don't want to give everything away, but God sends the Holy Spirit to dwell within the disciples to empower them to carry out his mission. It's so important that we work with God, with the church, in spreading the gospel message. So many people in the world are out there with no idea what we believe as Christians, outside of the way that Hollywood portrays us, which is so inaccurate that it would be laughable if it weren't so disappointing. There's a hunger for God in the human heart. We all have it. Not just the people that hear this message, but all people. It's built into us. Sometimes we call it the God-shaped hole in our heart. And there are people who go all their lives searching for the peg to fit that hole, only to come up short every time, because they're looking in all of the places where God is not. This directive that he gives to his disciples, he also gives to us, to proclaim the gospel message to all people. I'm not suggesting that we need to go door to door spreading the good news like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do but we are called to be living witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. Our words help, but our actions speak louder. What does that look like? Jesus gives us a list of signs that accompany those who believe. I would not recommend trying to pick up any venomous snakes with your bare hands or trying to drink some poison to see if it will harm you. Although I would recommend actions that we could take. The first is becoming more informed about the faith. People ask me sometimes, Father Matt, I read the Bible, but I just can't get into it, or I wish I could understand it more. To these individuals, I say, if you like to read, find yourself what we call secondary literature. Secondary literature is just a source that discusses the primary literature. There are countless commentaries on sacred scripture and the life of the faith that are easy to read and understand. A good number of my books from the seminary are at my parents' house, 
and my dad loves to read them. For people who don't like to read or don't have time, there are great Catholic podcasts that explain scripture and Catholic teaching in very accessible ways. The second recommended action, outside of snake handling, would be ministering to people in need. There are plenty of food pantries, soup kitchens, and other charitable organizations where we can meet people where they are and bring Christ to them through our actions. It may seem insignificant or even awkward sometimes, but the truth is that we are all creatures made for community. And personal interactions, especially for people who are lonely, mean more than you probably think. The final and probably most difficult thing that we can do as Christians empowered by the Holy Spirit is to fearlessly speak the truth, even in the face of opposition. The truth is hard to come by anymore, thanks to this cultural perception that there can be a your truth and a my truth, and somehow those two truths can be completely at odds with each other, and somehow both remain true. Speaking the truth in the face of being ostracized or canceled can be a powerful testimony to our faith. To sum up those three points, we need to know the truth, act the truth, and speak the truth that God has given us. In doing this, we fulfill that commandment that Jesus gave his apostles and us to go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. I pray that we are all given opportunities to live out our faith more robustly in order that the hearts and minds of those that we interact with every day may be converted and experience the joy that God brings to all of us. For Wineskins, I'm Father Matthew Hummerkaus. And then, Jesus went up into heaven. The followers stood there stunned and, looking up, the angel said, He will return in the same way that you have seen him go up to heaven. Let's look for Christ all around us. Wineskins is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. It is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a beautiful week. Mothers and fathers help shape the lives of children God has blessed them with. Catholic Charities feels Mother's Day to Father's Day is the perfect time to hold the annual First Step for Change campaign. First Step for Change helps provide assistance to low-income pregnant women and families with young children in obtaining infant supplies such as formula, diapers, and clothing, as well as case management and parenting support. Last year, Catholic Charities First Step programs assisted over 600 households. Please support the collection at your parish this year from Sunday, May 9th through Sunday, June 20th, or donate online at www.ccdoy.org or call the diocese for more information at 330-744-8451 extension 323.